federal funding for a postdoc that he took at Woods Hole, where he worked with some wonderful scientists, and I think some of you may even know him from Woods Hole. Um, his CV is chock, chock full, not only of the usual extensive papers and all the rest, but I love the list of awards. It's different from most people's. Most people, you see all these research awards, or either all these teaching awards, and his goes, best researcher in the university, uh, best undergraduate teacher in the university, and, and, and on. It's really quite wonderful. Uh, to have that kind of broad interests. Um, I think I won't say more about his background right now. I'll let him have the time to go on with this topic of the microbiome and the Darwin history. Okay, thank you, Rick. All right, pleasure to be here. Uh, and in particular, because I just left this weather right here. This is my daughter on our driveway. Uh, and, you know, she looks happy about it, but the rest of us parents don't. So. Thank you for the invitation, particularly at this time. All right, Darwin, uh, let's start with Darwin. He's the luminary in this field. Uh, we'll largely talk about the origin of species today. And what's interesting that I like to note is that Darwin uh, had some struggles with how we should think about the process of how one species splits into two. Um, in fact, he leaves us with this quote in, in The Origin of Species, no one has been able to point out what kind or what amount of difference in any recognizable character is sufficient to prevent two species crossing. So despite the title of this book, which may have been better called The Origin of Adaptations, uh, Darwin leaves the species problem, as it's called, the, the mystery of mysteries, as he called it, to future biologists. And I'm going to take you through a very brief history about how I look at this from an unusual angle, which is the role of microbes and symbiosis in the origin of species. So in 1927, Ivan Wallen, in his book Symbionticism in the Origin of Species, states it is a rather startling proposal that bacteria, the organisms which are popularly associated with disease, may represent the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species. Um, this is a pretty profound statement to make at this period in time because Koch's postulates rule the day. Microbes are bad things. Why would we ever in integrate them into the fundamental question about how new species form? What Wallen did was he looked inside the cells of plants and animals and noticed that mitochondria, which are intracellular uh, organelles, but also he realized for the first time that these are intracellular bacteria. Why? Because he saw mitochondria divide by binary fission and proclaim that binary fission is fundamentally a bacterial form of division. So if these organelles are dividing by binary fission, then they must be bacterial derived, if not bacteria themselves. And since all plant and animal cells have bacteria or mitochondria inside them, they must represent some fundamental building block to the origin of species. So Darwin's, or Wallen is effectually known as the mitochondria man, largely lost to history for a number of reasons. Uh, whoops, it looks like we lost animation. Interesting. That's going to be an issue. Yeah. Can we pause? Yeah. Because we're going to have to figure that out. Yeah, I think I might know. I actually, I think. <laughs> Okay, I got it, fixed it, it's on my end, all right. Sorry about that, thanks for your patience. So after Wallen, or actually the same year that Wallen publishes this book that very few of us probably are aware of, but I think should because this precedes Lynn Margulis's uh, claims on uh, mitochondria being derived from bacteria. In the same year, H.J. Muller's work on transmutagenesis and Drosophila fundamentally puts the genetic basis of adaptations of traits right into the nuclear chromosomes because he's able to radiate these flies and create mutants in these flies that are in fact mappable to their nuclear chromosomes. So this is the beginning of what's called the evolutionary modern synthesis where Darwinian evolution integrates into uh, Mendelian genetics and nuclear genetics. And in fact, this is even more emphasized by uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky who 10 years later publishes genetics in the origin of species and you'll note Dobzhansky's book looks pretty similar in, in the title to Ivan Wallen's book, just swapping out symbionticism and replacing it with genetics. Muller and Dobzhansky are pioneers of the evolutionary modern synthesis. We know who they are, and they essentially have formed the foundation for the next hundred years of biology. We get the biological species concept from Theodosius Dobzhansky, 
we get models of speciation based on nuclear genetic changes. And this, by and large, sets the path for, I think, how speciation has been studied uh, until recently. So here are three reasons to sum up why symbionts or microbes were not considered speciation agents until relatively recently. One, the origin of species. So Darwin's entire thesis is ba based on looking at eukaryotes, plants and animals. So biology at this time was a eukaryocentric field. Moreover, this is Whitaker's, actually no, this is Ernest Haeckel's um, vision of what a real tree of life may look like in 1866, just a few years after Darwin publishes The Origin of Species. And what you can't tell is that animals, plants, and protists, all eukaryotic, form the three major lineages of life. And everything below that, bacteria, for example, gets smushed down here in some ambiguous sort of root of the tree of life, but doesn't hold any importance. And this is clearly an incorrect view of the world as we now know. The second reason is that the modern synthesis happened, as I mentioned. In the 1920s, we have the fusion of Darwin with uh, Mendelian genetics, and this largely moves eukaryocentrism to nucleocentrism, where the foundation of biology sits in the nucleus in terms of the genetic changes that are happening. And, you know, we come up with ideas about the origin of species where, over time, the amount of genetic change that occurs increases over time, and this could eventually lead to a new species formation. And finally, microbial symbionts. Where are they in this discussion since Wallen first gave us the idea to perhaps look at microbes in the origin of species? And, you know, I think just prior to 10 years ago, this was the conventional lexicon in biology. Microbes are not specific to hosts. They're simply transient passengers that come and go, unlike genes that are inherited. They're not abundant, they're not genetically diverse, and they're not important to host fitness. Not everybody would have agreed with this, particularly the microbiologists, but this was, in, by and large, a common theme in the speciation field and in evolutionary biology. So what happened? Well, I think we very much know what happened. Uh, the last 10 years has seen a complete biological revolution, largely technology enabled, uh, with the first sequencers uh, being the Roche 454 sequences, sub subsequently replaced by alumina machines that ultimately led to a wave of interest and funding in the microbiome. This is just a Google search trend of how exponentially growing the microbiome is, just from the general public. Uh, the Human Microbiome Project was launched in 2008. Uh, the cover of The Economist was published in 2012. That's when things start to exponentially spike here, where there was a title named Microbes Maketh Man, and this really, I think, brought attention of the human microbiome to the public's uh, light. The NIH has clearly invested a lot of funding in this area, so from 2007 to 2012, we've had basically a doubling of the NIH funds, and while those funds were initially restricted to um, a common core fund for the Human Microbiome Project, they are now spreading out from that common core project to many centers, so we've also had a doubling of NIH centers or institutes funding the microbiome. So this is uh, clearly one of the biggest areas in biology right now. Okay, so let's take a, a philosophical view of what the microbiome research uh, means to date. Okay. So the genome is comprised of 20,000 genes. The microbiome is comprised of upwards of 10 million genes. So if you were to ask yourselves across the human body how genetically uh, endowed we are to our microbes, we would say that, in fact, we're 500-fold more genetically microbial than we are human, right? And, of course, people have talked about this in terms of a cellular number, that if you look at the landscape of microbes across the human body, each body site tends to have a unique set of microbes that are actually quite different from the other body sites and more similar across individuals. So, for example, your palm microbes would be more similar to her palm microbes than yours are to, let's say, what's in your mouth, your oral community. And 10% of the cells in this entire landscape are human or animal-derived cells. The other 90% are microbial. If we group the total genetics of those cells, the microbes and the human cells, uh, into a conglomerate, we would come up with this term, the hologenome, which some people are using to describe the innate complex assembly of microbes and host genes together to form the foundation for what functions in an animal. Okay. So we know that the microbiome is 
uh, adaptive. We know that when it goes wrong, it can associate with things like inflammatory bowel disease, it can associate with lung diseases such as cystic fibrosis, and we even know that the way babies are born are in part uh, um, affecting the way their initial microbial colonization occurs. So vaginal birth will deliver a certain set of microbes versus a C-section birth. Okay. So we know when things go bad. There's been a lot of interest in the role of the microbiome in disease states and even diet. But evolutionary biologists have had very little to say about what, what's, what matters in the assembly of the host genome and the microbiome and how does this affect the evolutionary process. That's what I think we can delve a lot deeper into. So what is a species made of? Uh, from a biological standpoint, the convention is this top line. The nuclear genome is comprised of typical uh, chromosomes, that those could include sex chromosomes, those could also include selfish genetic elements like meiotic drive elements or transposons, all of which together assemble into this thing called the nuclear genome. And that nuclear genome can be shuffled or stably transmitted either through vertical transmission maintaining a stable association of genes on the chromosomes or recombination which is, of course, a shuffling process that negates the stability of some genes on the chromosomes because they're obviously recombining between different genotypes. And the reason I point out recombination is because we tend to think of the nuclear genome as this uh, beautifully, stably, vertically inherited set of genes that form the foundation for the modern synthesis. But yet there's some instability in this genome derived from recombination and also derived from these selfish genetic elements. That relates to what else a species is made of because it's also made up of its microbiome. You can't get an animal or plant in nature without having a microbiome. It's fundamental to almost every biological aspect of these organisms. Now the microbiome will be made up of viruses, bacteria, archaea, organelles. Um, I consider organelles part of the microbiome because they are in fact bacteria or bacterial derived. And to some extent, the microbiome is vertically transmitted just like the nuclear genome. So now we see that there's some element of stable association here. There's also an element of horizontal transmission, a very strong element of horizontal transmission. I think this large fact where an animal acquires or a plant acquires its microbes from the environment has forced the view of a species in which the microbes are extrinsic to that species rather than intrinsic. But Horizontal transmission fundamentally is the same kind of disruptive force in an organism's genome or total genome just as recombination is. So there's a theoretical continuity here between shuffling of genes and instability and in, in gene combinations as well as shuffling of genes and microbes through horizontal transmission. So there's nothing actually fundamentally different about separating these into silos, but rather we perhaps can bring them together in an evolutionary foundation that hasn't quite uh, happened. Uh, until recently. So in regards to maternal transmission, I would like to say that we've put a little bit of effort into thinking about how extensive maternal microbial transmission is as a form of vertical transmission. And I would argue that our assumption that this is uncommon is probably inaccurate. And probably a far more realistic uh, vision is to think about how microbes may be maternally transmitted, either through external transmission or internal transmission. External transmission is uh, some obvious cases where the baby is acquiring its initial set of bacterial OTUs or species from the breast milk feeding, or even from the vaginal delivery where the baby acquires its initial microbial flora during the birthing process. Some people have gone to such extents that if their baby is born by C-section, they will actually take matters into their own hands and ensure that they get vaginal microbes onto the baby as a sort of natural delivery route rather than a foreign delivery route through C-section. Internal transmission, I think, is more provocative because this would suggest that the baby actually acquires its microbes before being born. And we have a sterile womb paradigm in biology that largely dominates reproductive biology. But what if mother is actually transferring microbes to the unborn child and seeds the initial development and essentially life of this child? We know very little about that and we assume that it has very little role, but we know that there's a placental microbiome and we know that there's bacteria in all of these things, okay? So that's an argument for not ignoring this particular aspect of our biology, which is so common in the invertebrate world. Insects are classic um, 
systems for studying vertical transmission of microbes, particularly transoviral transmission, where the mother will deposit bacteria right into the developing eggs uh, inside her. Moreover, there are starting to be cases of unusual maternal transmission. And when I say unusual, just cases where we haven't looked that far yet. Sponges definitely have maternal transmission of beneficial microbial communities. These vertebrate systems, there are early papers suggesting pathogenic transmission from mother to offspring, often in the egg or the yolk of the egg. So again, areas that I think we are uh, assuming probably too much that don't ha actually happen in biology where they probably do. Okay, so let's put all this together. What is a species? What's the relevance of transmission? And ultimately, let's get us back to Darwin's question of what makes a new species. So the most common way to think about this is we have a last common ancestor just before the speciation event, and we have a microbiome and a genome. And once these populations split into separate populations, they diverge over time, changing in color, therefore changing in genetics. Ultimately leaving us with two different populations or species that diverged both in their genome and their microbiome. And so when you bring these back together, it's possible that the hybrids may be dead or sterile. Let that joke sink in for a second. That's the only joke I have in this. The hybrids are dead or sterile. Thank you very much. Okay, it could also be that the hybrids or the parents just don't want to mate with each other so they won't produce any hybrids, okay? So this is when speciation is complete, when two populations no longer interbreed. So what are the reasons why we might consider the microbiome as fundamental to the origin of species? We've summed up at least three reasons, there are probably more. First of all, as we've talked about, there are no sterile hosts in nature. Uh, second of all, microbiomes are in fact host specific and I'll show you evidence for that today. And thirdly, the most rapidly evolving genes in the nuclear genome are usually immune genes across plants and animals. And if immune genes are the most rapidly evolving, it tells us that animals and plants are symbiotically interacting with microbes all the time, driving these rapid changes. Immune genes are windows into symbiosis. So if we map, let's say, speciation genes to chromosomes, that are immune genes in those areas, that's essentially mapping speciation by symbiosis because they fundamentally are part of the crosstalk between the host and the microbes. So our central hypothesis based on the, this evidence is that the microbiome will be as important as the genome and the origin of species. Okay, so here's our framework for thinking, uh, first thinking about why this might be. What guides the assembly of the microbiome in species? And there's two ways to look at this. Either you have a neutral biodiversity theory uh, or you have something called phylosymbiosis, which is a term we've used. So let's start with the neutral theory. The neutral theory would suggest that if you look at closely related species and you ask how similar are their microbial communities and correlate that to how similar are their nuclear genomes, there would be no pattern of co-assembly between the, geno the genomes of the microbes and then the genes in the genome. There simply is just no consistent assembly and everything would have an equal opportunity or all microbes would have an equal opportunity of colonizing those particular hosts. Alternatively, you could have a deterministic or selection model where host microbiome selection is responsible for the assembly of the microbes. And in this case, we might see a pattern like this microbiome similarity positively correlates with nuclear genetic similarity. And if that's the case, we can actually test that with a phylogenetic analysis by asking, does the phylogeny of the nuclear genome parallel the dendrogram of the microbial community relationships? Now, we're not talking about single microbes here in this particular microbial side of these trees. We're talking about total communities, hundreds to thousands of OTUs. So these are cluster community analyses, which we call dendrograms rather than true phylogenies. And that's why we use the term phylosymbiosis, because there really hadn't been a term yet uh, invented to describe the parallel changes between the nuclear genome and the total microbial community over time. So is that something we can actually test? We've been doing this with a tiny parasitic wasp called Nasonia. Now Nasonia is normally not this big, and it's normally, nor normally this colored. But this is a beautiful image that we false color just to give you a close up view of what, uh, what we're looking at here. This is a video. Uh, and so as you watch the video, I'll try and draw your attention to some of the evolutionary aspects and, and geographical aspects of this system. You're gonna see a male and a female courting each other in a minute. 
The two central things I need you to remember from this before your eyes get stuck are that there's a younger species pair between Longicornis and Giralti and an older species pair between Vitropenis and Giralti. So you'll note the divergence times of 400,000 years ago and 1 million years ago, and we'll constantly refer to these as older and younger species pairs. They in fact overlap uh, geographically, so in green is this Nisonia vitropenis species, Giralti is in red and lives sympatrically with vitropenis, and Longicornis is in yellow and also lives sympatrically with vitropenis. We actually have four species, three are only shown here in this work. Um, this is probably the second best genetic model to Drosophila in insects. Um, we have full genome sequences, we have excellent genetic tools, our lab has made germ-free rearing uh, available, and these are easily maintained insects. Okay, so you're observing here copulation, obviously, of the male with the female. Um, the male will perform a ritualized courtship display. She will acknowledge him by lowering her antenna, opening her abdomen. And ultimately, once he gets that signal, he will back up, inseminate for a few seconds, and then he actually has to come back and say goodbye. So he'll perform another courtship display um, to, in order to ensure that she won't mate again. Okay, so if you take a cross-section of Nisonia, you slice through it, and you stain for the dominant microbial group in Nisonia, which we know to be gamma proteobacteria, we see in this developmental stage that they localize in the hindgut. Uh, gamma proteobacteria are the most common types of bacteria in insects, in contrast to humans and other mammals. So you'll note that the green gamma proteobacteria are the dominant taxa in Nisonia, Drosophila flies, and Apis bees but they're relatively minor, if not absent, in human and other mammalian samples. And so the dominant ones in humans are Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes. The reason I want to point this out is it tells us that even at some very gross undersampled level, there's a species specificity of the microbial community assembly. Mammals tend to have Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. Insects, at least in these cases, tend to have gamma proteobacteria. Right. So, uh, looking at the microbial communities over development, we can see that the gut microbiome is definitely not stable throughout development. It's changing dynamically as metamorphosis occurs. In fact, if you look at these pie charts where the colors denote the species and the abundance of the species, so here we have very little d diversity, largely dominated by these particular proteobacterial species, and then over time, through pupation and then adulthood, we have a blossoming of microbial diversity, an increase in microbial diversity as this happens. And so we're gonna take these microbial communities and now ask, is there phylosymbiosis across the developmental stages? In the larval stage, we really don't have enough diversity in order to measure that. So we really are focused on the pupil stage and the adult stage where there's enough diversity to do this analysis. So here's our benchmark nuclear phylogeny older species pairs, younger species pairs, and we're simply asking when we make the dendrograms of the microbial communities, do they recapitulate the nuclear phylogeny? And the answer is yes, and the answer is that it's developmentally staged. So the pupil uh, development has a <coughs> distinct set of microbes from the adult uh, developments, but they are both phylosymbiotic at their respective stages, with G and L being more closely related to each other uh, than they are to vitropenis. And this is a, the highly statistically significant result. This was one of the first times uh, folks had ever observed a pattern like this. It's not the only time, but one of the first times that it had been observed and suggested to us that, you know what, the microbiome tells a story of ancestry that the genome is also telling us. So there could be some significance here in understanding evolutionary processes. So is phylosymbiosis neutral or adaptive? This pattern that we observed could just be a sort of neutral assembly of the microbes, right? Uh, now, we're arguing that by, because we see phylosymbiosis, this is probably not a neutral pattern. Otherwise, we'd see a random scattering of the microbes with no phylosymbiotic patterning. But we can also ask this question and test it experimentally by taking microbiome from taxa 1 and combining it with genome of taxa 2 or vice versa, and then asking is the fitness decreased when you swap the <coughs> microbiome and the genome together? And that would be the expectation if these phylosymbiotic patterns are in fact adaptive to the animals or functional in the animals. So we've started playing around with this recently in the lab. This is unpublished data and the answer so far is yes. And what we're seeing is that over development during the larval stages, um, as we measure larval size from day two, day three, day four, and day five, 
we see that the heterologous microbiota, that is the, a different species microbiota put into a, a, a background that's common among these three samples, their development is slowed at each of these stages, whereas the autologous microbiota for the correct species is always significantly advanced. Um, so we, we are arguing that just by swapping the microbiota, you can slow down development almost to a state that the germ-free microbes develop, uh, that the germ-free organisms develop. And that's a pretty common feature in animal germ-free systems, that development is slowed to some degree. Uh, these animals usually don't make it in the wild. And so by swapping and showing that the heterologous microbiota is developmentally slowed like a germ-free microbiota, we're, we're showing that there's this match between the genome and the microbiome. Okay, the other system that has nicely shown phylosymbiosis are these basal metazoans called hydra. And they'd done the same thing. Uh, this is a paper published in PNAS in 2013, where they simply took three different individuals from each of these hydra species and showed a complete parallel pattern of the microbiota with the host species phylogeny. This is intriguing to us because it could just be that hydra and Asonia are special, or it could be that this is a more universal phenomena. So recently in the lab, we've devoted ourselves to measuring several different animal species complexes to ask, is this a common phenomena in the animal world that we haven't appreciated yet, or is it not? So we're looking at four different taxa that are easily reared in the lab and that we can control their diet. It's important to note that in all of these systems, we're giving Nasonia the same diet, we're giving all these Drosophila species the same diet, so that diet doesn't have an influence on the microbiome assembly, all right? So host genetics is going to be interacting with the microbiota to structure any of these assemblies. We also have this vertebrate species, deer mice, uh, which is quite helpful to scaling ourselves out of the invertebrate world to the vertebrate world. A total of 24 taxa were looked at, spanning enormous divergence times, and as I mentioned, diets controlled. So what do we see? Well, uh, I need to tell you how we measure this before I tell you what we see. So there's two statistical tools I want to tell you about. One is the Mantell test and one is the Anasim test. Mantell test tells us how similar are these species phylogenies with the microbiota dendrograms. It's going to tell us statistically is there significant support for the parallel pattern or the phylosymbiotic pattern. So rather than just showing you the pattern, is there statistical support for it? And the second is the Anasim test, which tells us within each uh, set of species, we measure multiple individuals and ask, are those microbiomes more clustered, more similar to each other within species than between species? And so when Anasim tells us that we have a significant result, it means that there's significant clustering of individual microbiomes within species, rather than sort of dissipated random microbiomes across species. All right, here's deer mice and mosquitoes. Yes, I did. A little slow. Okay. So deer mice uh, are, are, are showing perfect phylosymbiosis. Um, you can see that the Mantell test gives us an R value, which is essentially like an R squared value of 0.48, and the P value is very significant. Um, we have six taxa here spanning a total of 7 million years of divergence. The mosquitoes are doing the same thing. We've actually looked at many different types of mosquitoes in the larval stage in particular. Um, so we've reached a, a level of divergence that even surprised us. It's 108 million years of divergence, and we're still seeing very good evidence for phylosymbiosis. All right. So what does this mean in terms of uh, other ways of looking at the data? Well, as I mentioned, the Anasim test tells us something about the clustering of individuals' microbiomes within a particular species. And so each color denotes a species and each circle denotes an individual within those species. This principal component analysis shows you how well clustered those microbiomes are across species and within species. This is strongly supported clustering. Um, and another way to look at this is if you look at the distances of each microbiome sample within a species, that is how similar or how different are these versus how different is this species microbiome, to this species microbiome, we should generate this prediction where intergroup comparisons of the microbial distances is significantly lower than the intergroup distances. And in all cases, that is true. Okay, Drosophila females um, and the Sonia females, again, show us the same pattern. Uh, Drosophila is an ex interesting example. So in the three or four papers that are published on Drosophila gut microbiota thus far, 
there's no indication that there's been phylosymbiosis. We largely observe phylosymbiosis with one species swap. And there are some reasons I could tell you more about why we think we're getting it when other papers haven't. But they have to do with controlling the gender. So females often have a different microbiota than males, and previous studies hadn't controlled for gender. gender. And diet as well. So we've controlled for diet where other species hadn't. Um, so we're going to have a nice story to tell about why, how you do an experiment with the microbiome matters to whether you see this ancestral relationship or not. And Nisonia once again shows us the pattern. So if you put this all together in sort of a meta-analysis, you get an interesting view of all of this diversity, uh, color-coded for all these animals. And we've added in a hominid study uh, to this uh, pattern because we simply wanted to know, does the mammalian microbiota uh, cluster more similar to each other than they do to the invertebrates. And, and indeed, that's what we see here. Uh, so there's, a, there's a, an expected phylogenetic pattern um, even across these gross uh, differences in animals. Okay, so we've thoroughly looked at phylosymbiosis at this point. We haven't talked a lot about the evolution of reproductive isolation in new species. And the crux of the matter is when we bring two species together and interbreed them, we'd like to know in cases where the hybrids are dying, why are they dying? And there are three possible reasons why hybrids could die. One is the standard model. That is, genes in the genome are simply in negative epistasis or negatively interacting with each other so that their functions break down and the hybrids die because they can't complete normal development. This is what's known as the dobzhansky muller model of hybrid incompatibilities, if you're familiar with that. The second way would be just having divergence in the microbial communities driving speciation. So in fact, the genetics of the host genetics, the nuclear genetics, doesn't matter. These genomes could be completely identical. But if they have different microbes that cause the speciation event, then that's simply a microbe-microbe interaction. And the final one would be combining all of this together, that it takes both the microbiome and the genome to drive the origin of new species. And we'll call this hologenomic speciation. So I bring you back to Nasonia for two stories then. Uh, one will be, in fact, the microbe-microbe story, and then the second will be the gut microbiome by genome story. The microbe-microbe story involves an F1 hybrid inviability in Nasonia. The other one involves an F2. So when we measure F2 hybrid inviability later on in this talk, note that we've done it in the absence of these microbe-microbe incompatibilities by curing these individuals of this initial infection to allow us to look at the F2 generation. So we'll start with the F1. Uh, what we're talking about here are germline infections that are maternally inherited from mother to the developing oocytes. These are bacteria called Wolbachia. And what you're looking at here is a, a Nasonia embryo. In blue are the mitotically dividing chromosomes of the embryo. And in green are the Wolbachia symbionts localized at the posterior end of the embryo. This is important. These cells are located near the, post, the pole cells uh, and ultimately the cells that become faded to develop into the reproductive tissues, so ovaries and testes. Wolbachia are germline specialists, so somehow they figured out early in development to specialize in the cells that become faded for reproductive tissues. And that's shown here in the Sonia testes, the, in this case the Wolbachia are stained in red and populate the testes at a high density. And if you go in by transmission electron microscopy, you cut slices through the testes and zoom in, you can find Wolbachia cells. So this is about a micron in size, and it's not too interesting to look at, except in this picture we did catch uh, a lytic phase of these bacteriophage low <coughs> particles that we also study in the lab, and I won't tell you too much about today. <coughs> That's just a zoomed in uh, picture of these typical phages. Okay, so n the Wolbachia infections are preeminent examples of uh, bacterial infections that can hijack sexual reproduction of animals. And they do this across all major insect orders and many arthropods. And one of the ways they do it to spread themselves is called CI, or cytoplasmic incompatibility. So, so here an infected male crossed to an uninfected female is going to give us no offspring. The reciprocal cross and all self-crosses are compatible. Um, the, the reason this is leading to embryonic death, in fact, is because the Wolbachia in the testes modify the sperm, the sperm leave without Wolbachia and fertilize the uninfected egg, and then if you look at the first mitosis of the paternal and maternal chromatin, the paternal chromatin here and here does not condense as it would have to to go through mitosis, 
And ultimately, the maternal chromatin is condensing ready to go through mitosis, and the paternal chromatin gets shredded. And you have an aneuploid egg that dies. And that's what Wolbachia is inducing to generate this one-way crossing incompatibility. Why does it do that? It does that to spread itself, because Wolbachia are maternally transmitted. So you'll note the infection frequency in the next generation, these offspring here, have two-thirds, or 66%, are going to be infected. Whereas in the parental generation here, the infection frequency is 50%. So by reducing the fitness of uninfected females, Wolbachia spreads itself and gives a fitness advantage to infected females. It's pretty sinister and very cool. Uh, <laughs> bidirectional CI is an uh, extension of unidirectional CI. Here we have two different infections of uh, Wolbachia with different genetics, so we'll call these strains, and they're reciprocally incompatible, whereas in both self-crosses they're compatible. Now here's where speciation gets interesting, because you can in theory have no nuclear genetic changes in an animal species. They simply have two different Wolbachia infections and they are reproductively isolated as the biological species concept would define them. Symbiosis, in, if this can be observed, is the only explanation for uh, speciation. So here's this uh, model, and we're, we're actually going to call this an infectious speciation model because Wolbachia are by and large parasites or pathogens. So imagine we have this ancestral host population that doesn't have Wolbachia. Ultimately, different Wolbachia infections come in by horizontal transfer. Those infections spread by the unidirectional CI dynamics that we just talked about to fixation, generating two populations that just defer in their Wolbachia infections, and when you bring them back together, you get bidirectional CI and good biological species. In fact, you could reverse this speciation event if you could antibiotically cure these in nature. Right? That's sort of the weird uh, uh, way to think about infectious speciation. So we observe this in Nisonia repeatedly across all the species pairs. So when we interbreed, for example, the older species pair, Geralti and Vitropenis that diverged a million years ago, in the presence of Wolbachia, and then when they're cured, you can see that Wolbachia has a very strong role in preventing hybrid formation uh, in these two interspecific crosses, whereas the self-crosses are quite fine. The same thing for the younger species pair. It's not quite to the same extreme, but largely uh, uh, explaining most of the problems here and that the F1 hybrids are largely produced, if not produced in greater numbers, when Wolbachia is cured in the parental species. So parents can make good hybrids without a problem. It's just the Wolbachia is preventing them from making those hybrids. If you look at not just Wolbachia, but a number of other isolation barriers that prevent gene flow between these species in the F1 or the F2 generation. The older species pair has an accumulation of problems that prevent gene flow between these species, whereas the younger species pair primarily has the Wolbachia issue and a little bit of mate discrimination. So the significance of this is we can say that Wolbachia can evolve early enough in the speciation process to drive the reproductive isolation and splitting of the species truly symbiotically driven uh, uh, elements of speciation here. So if you want to put this in a visual, imagine that a correlation between genetic divergence, so increasing genetic divergence, correlates with increasing amounts of uh, lack of interbreeding or reproductive isolation. And when we have a value of one, the species can no longer interbreed. So the older species pair falls somewhere around here because they're about a million years old, they have a number of reproductive isolation traits, and they're good species. Now in the absence of Wolbachia, the younger species pair is going to look something like this. Not a lot of genetic divergence, and a little bit of mate discrimination prevents the amount of interbreeding, just a little bit. But when Wolbachia comes in, it could, in theory, push it to complete speciation, or just below it, because we have a little bit of gene flow in the presence of bidirectional CI for these guys. But you can see how an infection can drive speciation events rapidly relative to the steady accumulation of changes by nuclear genes. Okay, that's Wolbachia. Uh, what about beyond Wolbachia? And I started this talk on the gut microbiome. I'd like to end it on the gut microbiome because Wolbachia is a microbe that is fascinating and occurs in about 40% of all insect species. Uh, but not all animals are insects, but all animals do have some form of gut with some interaction with the microbes that it would be worthy of looking at whether the gut microbiome is a common phenomena in driving the origin of species.
Okay, so we'll return to the phyllosymbiosis we observed in Nisonia, and we're gonna add on one layer of information, which is when you make hybrids between these two species, the older species pairs, now in the absence of Wolbachia, uh, we can interbreed these. We get F1 hybrids, but the F2 hybrids look like this, and in fact die. This is a non-hybrid, just a viable parent larva. This is a F2 hybrid larvae with an extreme melanization response. And in fact, that melanization response is just the host launching melanin to encapsulate what usually are pathogens in the hybrid larvae. This trait uh, is strong. It's been studied for many decades. Uh, and we know it has a genetic basis where the nuclear genome and the mitochondria interact with each other. So the conventional uh, way to study speciation is to look for the genes that underlie the speciation trait. And so when Jurgen Godau's lab here, your, your great colleague, uh, looked at this, he found that there are a number of traits that could be mapped to some of the five chromosomes, or a number of regions that could be mapped to the five chromosomes of Nisonia, leading uh, to show that there's a genetic basis for this hy hybrid inviability, that these genes contribute to the trait. But the other way to think about it is from a microbial <coughs> perspective, and that's what I'm interested in. And so what is the microbial basis of this trait? Given that we saw phyllosymbiosis, and given that we saw this melanization problem, um, if you look at the <coughs> microbes in this hybrid, they're <coughs> distinctly different from the parental microbial communities, right? So death is associating not only with these genes on the chromosomes, but with an altered microbial community and with a melanization response that we know is problematic uh, for controlling microbes. So here's the, here's the hypothesis. The gut microbes are in fact a part of the cause, <coughs> plus the genetic factors for hybrid mortality. Our experimental predictions are a non-hybrid Nisonia looks fine and will live. A conventionally reared hybrid will die usually. Um, if we germ-free rear this conventional hybrid, we should now be able to rescue the mortality if the microbes are causal. And then we should be able to put the microbes back into the germ-free hybrid and reinstate the mortality. So we have simply devised a germ-free rearing method. I shouldn't say simply, it took a graduate student a few years to do this. But essentially we take this <laughs> WAS eggs, which are deposited into the host, and we transfer them to an in vitro rearing system. It's a transwell plate where they're sitting on top of a filter. And right underneath the filter is a uh, rearing media devised from the host that these eggs would normally, or larvae would normally feed off of. We can get eggs to develop to pupae at a very high rate with this method and allows us to do this kind of experiment. So here's F2 hybrid mortality in a conventional state. When we do the germ-free rearing, the hybrid mortality is largely rescued. That was the eureka moment for us when we were able to rescue a significant amount of the mortality. And in this case, there's actually no statistically significant differences between those and the parents. And then if you put the bacteria back in, you can reinstate the hybrid mortality that occurred, therefore satisfying Koch's postulates essentially that the microbes are causal to the reproductive isolation that had been typically studied from just a genetic perspective. Okay, so uh, how can we further uh, look at this as a combina combinatorial trait between the genes that have been mapped and the microbes that are going awry? And one of the ways we thought of doing that is essentially asking, can we erase the significance of these QTL regions when we germ-free rare the hybrids? In other words, these are the hybrids in the F2 generation. Typically, when you measure the genetic basis of these speciation traits, you will look for transmission ratio distortion in the alleles that have mapped to these regions. So in other words, we won't see Mendelian inheritance of 50-50 ratios at these loci. We'll see things like 75% ratios, which is a distortion from Mendelian ratios that link these genetic traits to the reproductive isolation. But in the germ-free system, we imagine that we could restore the marker transmission ratio distortions back to 50-50 Mendelian inheritance. And that's exactly what we were able to show. So therefore, the QTLs are contingent on the presence of the microbiome uh, therefore showing that this trait takes two to tango. You've got to have the genome and the microbiome to get a problem. We've looked at gene expression uh, to further answer what genes are causing this uh, deleterious interaction with the microbes. These are the immune gene expression relative to the rest of the genome. And the immune genes are hyperexpressed when the hybrids are dying but they're underexpressed when we remove the microbes. Now that's very logical. There's nothing uh, surprising about that. But it does allow us to ask, 
what are the particular immune genes that are hyperexpressed relative to the germ-free organisms that are not dying. And so you'll notice these four candidates here, uh, SPs, and they have a high expression um, in the inoculated and conventional states relative to the germ-free, which makes these very attractive candidates for what's happening in the nuclear genome that interacts with the microbes. Now these SPs are serine proteases, and it's just fortuitous. Uh, and so we're currently working on tracking this down because the serine proteases sit at the top of the signaling cascade <coughs> that launch profanal oxidase. And profanal oxidase launches the melanin response, which is what we see here. So either we're totally fooled by the transcription data or we've just landed right on what should be a link between what's happening uh, with melanin production and the misexpression of those genes that is contingent on the microbes being there. Okay, so we're trying to knock those genes down. We have no data to report on that yet, but I think we're close. So we've had these two stories, both Wolbachia uh, and the gut microbiome, that cause uh, the origin or assist the origin of species in Nisonia. You know, and I would like to leave you thinking, did we just get lucky here? Did we just happen to choose Nisonia as a system that would tell us repeatedly that microbes are involved in the speciation process? Or is it just that we've asked the question in this system? And if other investigators ask the question in their animal systems and plant systems, will they find the same phenomena? And I would argue it's the latter, not the former. And why I think that is because microbes drive the origin of many species, perhaps. So we know many cases in Drosophila flies. We know many cases where ecologically deficient hosts so aphids that couldn't feed on plant sap unless they had symbionts to diversify on their plant sap wouldn't exist without their symbionts. So the origin of aphids is entirely dependent on symbiosis and perhaps the divergence within those symbionts. Immune genes in plants, immune genes in humans are often under the most intense uh, positive selection and rapid evolution and can lead to, at least in the plant case, hybrid necrosis problems of these hybrids from these two plant of varieties. Okay, so let me bring you back to the beginning. What's changed uh, with this knowledge and that of others? Well, the first problem changed really, I think, with Carl Woese. When Carl Woese gave us the true genealogical tree of life, rather than uh, Ernest Haeckel's tree, we have the molecular tree of life that tells us all of, most of the diversity of life is microbial, we suddenly get out of eukaryocentrism in a very quick way. It wasn't easy for Carl to sell this work. I mean, some of the great evolutionary biologists of his time, Ernest Meyer, had formal commentaries in PNAS over why this is wrong, but it's entirely correct. Uh, we've gotten over nucleocentrism as well. In the last decade, we've seen the gut microbiome take off in an amazing way that redefines who animals and plants are, essentially. And finally, we've gotten past the microbial symbiont problem. We are arguably in what Eugene Koonin is called and what Margaret McFall and I likes to use, a postmodern synthesis, where the centrality of microbes in biology is a far more accurate vision than what we've had thus far. So I don't know if I've convinced you of that, but I hope to have lead you at least with a thought today. So here's the team that was uh, contributing to this work. Um, a lot of it was done by Dr. Robert Brucker, who was a graduate student and now a junior fellow at Harvard. And then I have uh, three active graduate students, Lisa, Andrew, and Teddy, that have contributed to this work and a bioinformatician, Rini, as well. And finally, uh, funding by the NSF Dimensions of Biodiversity Program that aims to integrate these three dimensions uh, into, their, into their research proposals that they fund. And so with that, I thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. Sure. So, so I have a question about your uh, controlled diet and what the basis of that diet is might have an influence on the microbiome of the heterologous species because the biome is changing to compensate for the distinction between the native diet and your controlled diet. So the species whose diet is most similar to the controlled diet has its regular biome, but the species whose diet is normally different might be shifted toward that controlled uh, diet's microbiome artificial. Yeah. How do you control for that? Uh, that's, I mean, that's an interesting point. There's, there's obviously a, a thousand ways to skin this cat. The reason we've controlled for diet, I will reiterate, the null hypothesis has been diet shapes the microbiome. So we wanted to get rid of that variable. 
My argument around your specific example is while I agree with you that a species may not be natively adapted to the microbiome, so therefore it'll have an altered microbiome by de facto, it does not follow that that microbiome should follow a phylosymbiotic pattern after that. And so the fact that we see phylosymbiosis gets, I wouldn't say gets around that, but gets over the sort of null prediction that things are just wrong, so we'll see a random microbiome. We don't see that. The very last talk I've ever heard, Lynn Margulis speak. She, it was maybe 10 years ago, she spoke of the microbiome influencing hominid evolution. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't go over well. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but I think your work really beckons that question. Yeah. yeah. What is your idea? Right. On, I mean, you, you, you showed one of the branched uh, yes. phylogenomic so it's a good question, and, and some, some investigators are now showing that hominid uh, microbiome evolution is phylosymbiotic, that it parallels the phylogeny of hominids, right? So you see that phylosymbiosis. But that work didn't control for diet, which is one reason I don't go into it in detail in this talk, because it could be that those phylosymbiotic patterns are just generated by dietary choices. Um, but there is indication that that is part of Whatever Lynn said, it's consistent with what she said. Now, I have a more specific idea about how to approach this in human evolution that I'll talk about in my chalk talk, perhaps. And so um, I will save that, but I am interested in that question. Scaling out of models into human microbiomes. Yeah. So in the Wolbachia system, we have the two prisoner problem where each assumes the other's going to squeal, and so they, they make the, the, the offspring in the cross die, essentially the two prisoner problem. Do you know what is actually what they're doing and what are the genetic components of the Wolbachia that are actually causing that difference? Yeah, so that is... Because you have that speciation event too. Yeah, that's the $2 million question for the NIH. <laughs> but yes, you're right. Um, that has been the holy grail of the field for the last 40 years, independent of speciation. Just how does a microbe hijack sexual reproduction of its host? Um, there's been a lot of effort with zero knowledge, except for what I showed you in terms of the cytology after fertilization, but we don't know what Wolbachia are modifying in the sperm. That being said, uh, I will talk about uh, a project that we've just submitted as an R21 to the NIH on two candidate genes that look promising that cause cytoplasmic incompatibility, and these are genes for Wolbachia. Um, but I don't want to talk about them too much, just to say that we have some data on that. And in the serine proteases, are those analogous to complement serine proteases, or are they uh, something else? What, I actually don't know what you mean by complement serine proteases. Immune mean complement system, serine proteases that optimize things? Okay. I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Yes? Uh, it wasn't quite clear to me when you had the hybrids and transferred the microbiota back again. Which microbiota is actually transferred? Is this the hybrid one or the parental one? Good question, one? yeah. Uh, so it's the parental microbiota because the parental microbiota is most relevant. Um, what's normal in the parents is what we give the hybrids and causes that deleterious interaction. And we also know that just by measuring hybrid microbiotas, that the most dominant microbes in the hybrids are derived from parents, which is additionally why we are using the parental microbiota as the inoculum to, to simulate what's happening naturally in the hybrids. So if you look at hybrid microbiota, would it be a sort of a blend of the parental ones, actually, or how does this play out? Yeah. I mean, the idea, of course, at the end of the day is uh, what the hell is the microbiota doing? Because yeah. Um, there's two ways to look at that. I mean, the first part is the microbiota is largely derived from the dominant bacteria, and actually a rear bacteria in the parents that become dominant in the hybrids. So this looks like the host losing control of the, of the microbiome and then a pathogenic one becomes dominant, if we are allowed to say that. Okay, we don't know that's truly pathogenic. The hybrid breakdown is probably an interaction between um, bacterial components, either a secretion factor or cellular components, such as peptid or glycan, that launches the immune response that then gives us melanization. So when we get rid of the microbiome, we remove that immune sensing, essentially, of the microbes. 
We also believe the reverse. We think that if we knock down the Styrian proteases, uh, we will be able to eliminate the sensing mechanism of the microbiota and therefore rescue the hybrids that way, showing that it takes two to tango. So that's our approach thus far. Whittling down to the exact bacterial components, that's doable. It's not currently our mission right now, but you could imagine ways to sort of look at different components of the bacteria by weight, density centrifugation, and testing whether inoculating that into the hybrids causes the mortality or not. Yeah, good question. Uh, let me go in the back and then I'll come up front. Sorry, I saw the back question here. So um, I think there's at least some evidence that Wolbachia can be positive in the Drosophila. You know, with your Nasonia experiments, are they only negative? Since you yeah, as far as we know. Up? I mean, yeah. but, you're, but you're comparing them to antibiotically treated controls. We have, uh, that's right. In Drosophila, they're done the same way. You, you're removing Wolbachia by antibiotics and then testing the fitness yeah. of uninfected versus infected. Yeah. We've done that in Estonia. We don't see a fecundity or fitness advantage. It's pretty neutral outside in the CI. And, we'll, and in Drosophila, it changes. The age of the uh, association affects the fitness outcome. So a long-term Wolbachia association in Drosophila has associated with a fitness advantage. Short-term associations can also reduce fitness, independent of the CI. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know the exact boundaries on what gets included in the microbiome, but it strikes me that um, there are eukaryotic metazoan organisms that live symbiotically in our bodies as well. Yeah. And uh, what do these, are you extending these ideas to those kinds of organisms as well? Do you think they also can play a role in these evolutionary species? I do. You know, it, clearly we're bacteriocentric in this effort, right? <laughs> the viruses are there. Uh, the archaea, there are probably archaeal symbionts there. And as you mentioned, protists and maybe even multicellular organisms. Um, so it's, it's definitely a worthy pursuit to think about that. If we didn't see the effects we were observing here, we probably would have moved on to these other microbial components. But clearly the bacteria are having some role in this process, which was satisfactory. Um, but I could imagine those are players in different systems across different speciation events. The microbiome, uh, you know, it, it's almost loosely defined. Is, does that mean single-celled organisms only, or does that mean multicellular organisms that are microscopic? I don't think I've ever seen anybody define what the microbiome is. Yeah. Yeah. I understand there's a common dove or pigeon uh, that is found all the way from Spain all the way to China, and it can interbreed so many miles apart all the way across. But okay. if you take them from China and you take them from Spain, the offspring are incompatible, you don't get anything. So you have the, essentially what is defined as the same species, common, and it must be the same species in generally because it's, you can find it continually all the way across this ge huge geographic area. Right. I guess 8,000 miles. Yeah. But, uh, I, I would imagine, has anybody looked at this, uh, the, uh, where probably the major difference is the microbiome? Case in point, but outside of Nisonia, um, people have worked on Wolbachia only, but not general gut microbes or general microbiome of any tissue. So I think we're trying to really break the glass ceiling and, and hopefully motivate other investigators to look at this. We would argue that it's you can't just look at nuclear genetics and you can't just do microbiome. You've got to integrate both to get the holistic story. I will say, in, you know, just in, uh, in response to your example of what, you, what we call a ring species, where there's layers of interbreeding, but at the edges there's no interbreeding if you bring them back together, that that's actually evidence for the evolution of species itself. That is, that it is a gradual process, not an instantaneous process. And so that, that gray area that you're describing is, is evidence for speciation being a process that evolves over time, rather than, sure. yeah. But with the Wolbachia, you've got two distinct populations on the east coast and west coast. Yeah. And, you know, but also we have sympatrically interacting species. Yeah. True. Yeah. But um, nothing quite like like this, where you it's really defined as currently as one species, and it can go continually across the continent, but not. Uh, I see. You're, so Jurgen wants to chime in here, so maybe he. No, no, it's a completely different question. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. There's a, um, I read this morning a paper on current 60 million years kind of people to hybridize, and plants are known to hybridize much freely. Yeah. Their species 
porous and what's more porous. Is there a fundamental difference in the microbiome of plants and animals? I mean, has anybody looked at that? Uh, the, there's no gut in plants, but they have <laughs> they have leaves and they have roots, and they have roots, and that's the centrality of microbiome and plant work right now. Is what is the rhizosphere? What is the leaf microbiome? How does that impact? So Kirsten Bombley's work. Yeah, I saw that. Right. Yeah, this is a hybrid necrosis problem that's linked to immune genes. Uh, but she never tells us what's going on with the microbes in these hybrids. And, but that's also not linked to speciation, right? Well, it is, it is the origin of reproductive isolation right. yeah. between varieties of the same plant species. Mm -hmm. Almost getting back to this question here. And so what if you did antibiotic treatments here? And so would she be able to rescue these back to normal state? That's the experiment that's missing in so many speciation studies. Yeah, but I'm just I'm wondering, I mean, it's long known that plants hybridize more. Indeed. Yeah, and yeah. so I think mean, yeah. there's a fundamental difference in microbes. Or a different I mean, nobody found that there is a difference. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Nobody worked really hard stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, did we get everybody? Okay, thank you guys. A couple more minutes, and everybody wants to ask more. Well, I just had a fun question not being in the field. Excellent. How do you swap out the microbiome and just look at a small watch? Right. <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's, it's, it's actually more simple than you would think. We simply culture the bacteria on agroplates, and so we're getting some of the dominant representatives that way. And we generate pure cultures that we then put into these transwell assay plates that we developed for in vitro rearing of the sun. So they're sitting on this filter, and beneath it is the rearing media plus the microbes. And so the wasps are feeding on that media through the filter and sucking up the media and the bacteria that we've put into it. And then you can verify on the cross the bureau, otherwise they swap out the microbiome and just do that before. Well, we could do that. Um, there's really no other way to look at it. They are, they will be contacting and feeding on that. They will be exposing themselves to it, but we could verify it by culturing things back from the gut that these were feeding on. Yeah. Great. Was there one more over here? No. Well, I was going to save it for tomorrow. But okay. Because okay. Randy's pushing for more questions. Uh, the whole thing, that, the one thing that's bothering me is the, is the total numbers involved. Um, I mean, it's a very striking idea, and you get good evidence. But when I mean, you think about the total number of genes in a genome, uh, you know, twenty thousand, right? And the total number of genes in a in a microbiome, I mean, it's hard to believe that conceptually that a single one of them could cause a speciation event. <clears throat> and that basically seems to be what you're proving that, that this, you know, just a change in one. Uh, uh, yeah, at least in Wolbachia. Gut micro changes, changes, changes the species. So, uh, so it's just a conceptual problem for me. <laughs> yeah. Are you thinking about that? Have you ever thought about that at all? I guess I would say that in Wolbachia's case, which is this germline infection, it's, there's, there's no doubt that it's one infection causing the problem. Um, I think in the gut microbiome case, it's perhaps conceivable that you could test multiple species of microbes that are native to Nasonia and show that they all elicit the hybrid mortality. So it could be that, in fact, multiple microbes cause the same problem. Uh, and then you move to non-native bacteria in Nasonia, things that Nasonia haven't co-evolved with, let's say archaea or bacteria from hydrothermal vents. And you put those into Nasonia, you would not expect those to elicit the hybrid mortality we see because the Nasonia system just wouldn't recognize them. They've never co-evolved with them. right? So that's actually an experiment we want to do, and, uh, and I think would be worthwhile to do. Um, but, yeah. Okay, on that note, thanks for Okay, time. thanks guys.